Up next, Bernard Gersh is joined by Dr. Ben Friedman, Professor of Cardiology at the University of Sydney in Australia. They cover aspirin for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation, myth or mantra. So, welcome you to Axel. Thanks very much. And Ben, this was really your idea to write this paper. So give us an idea of the background related to the misperception that aspirin is useful in stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. Well, I think, Bernie, it comes from a perception that it's very effective in coronary disease. And therefore, in thrombotic disease, you might expect it also to be effective in atrial fibrillation. The original trials, many of them had aspirin as a comparator in the arm. And so in a meta-analysis done by Hart, I found that aspirin was modestly effective. I think the figure was it was a 19% reduction. In stroke. In stroke versus 68, 70% with warfarin. But all of that came from one trial, didn't it? That was the SPAF study. And in fact, the real problem with that study, and it's been highlighted if you want to read about it in the latest US guidelines for atrial fibrillation, that there was a huge heterogeneity in that study in the warfarin eligible and the warfarin ineligible arms, where aspirin reduced stroke compared to placebo by either 94% or 8%. And then they combined the two, didn't they? They combined the two. And if you leave those things out, aspirin doesn't work. So I think that is clearly a flawed trial. And the old data, now as you look at it with that in mind, aspirin doesn't work. What about some of the more recent data? There have been some specific trials. And tell us about them from an efficacy standpoint and a bleeding standpoint. There have been a number of registry trials looking at aspirin efficacy. And in fact, when you look at that, the bottom line is it doesn't work for stroke prevention. In our own study, which was a cohort study in the United Kingdom on incidentally discovered atrial fibrillation, it was no different to no therapy as far and, as stroke prevention. And in the BATF trial, I think it's spelled what, B-A-A-T-A-F? BAFTA, yeah. BAFTA, the Birmingham trial. That was yeah. a direct comparison of aspirin and warfarin, and aspirin yeah. was inferior. Aspirin was inferior in the Averroes trial. It was inferior. And also, there was a similar risk of bleeding. So the problem, you've got a two-phase problem. One is that it's not effective, and the second is that there's a similar bleeding rate, so they're actually not safe. And people, both doctors and patients, assume that it's safe. You can buy it over the counter, you give it without a prescription, so it should be safe, but it's not. It produces a similar amount of bleeding. Even in the very, one of the pivotal trials of aspirin in primary prevention, the US Physicians Trial, which was essentially a negative trial, although it did reduce non-fatal MI, it didn't reduce death, but it had an increase in intracerebral hemorrhage. And this wasn't really emphasized. So aspirin is not a safe drug. And certainly when it comes to stroke prevention, atrial fibrillation, it's just not effective either. What I think is also interesting, you did refer to the Averroes study of apixaban versus aspirin, is the bleeding rates on apixaban and aspirin were very similar. Well, that's right. And when you look at individual patient meta-analyses of aspirin trials, there's no net clinical benefit in those trials because it causes bleeding as well as not being particularly effective. The other point I think we should make was we do have good clinical trial data that aspirin and clopidogrel is more effective in preventing thromboembolism than aspirin alone. But I don't think what is made enough of is emphasized enough is yes, it was more effective, but there was considerably more bleeding. I mean, there was the same amount of bleeding on aspirin clopidogrel as warfarin. If you're trading the same amount of bleeding for less efficacy, that's a bad trade-off. So, Ben, you've made the point repeatedly, and I think it's a very good point, and that is that the perception that aspirin is effective has provided physicians and patients with a, quote, soft option. So... We don't want to put them on warfarin or they don't want to be on an oral anticoagulant. I shouldn't just say warfarin. They don't want to. And we say, well, the guidelines say that you can be on aspirin if you CHADS 1 or whatever, CHADS 2 basket 1. And so that may really contribute to the fact that the utilization of aspirin probably is no more than at the moment, maybe 60% amongst patients who are eligible, maybe a little higher 
more recently. But the fact remains, a large number of patients who should be in oral anticoagulants are not. Are not because they're on aspirin. Well, look, I think the perception by physicians that it's something to do because it was in the guidelines, it's been progressively removed, but some guidelines still have it for some of the indications or if people won't take an anticoagulant. But I don't think we try hard enough because aspirin is just not effective and it's not safe. It's led to a reduction in prescription of anticoagulant. That's the, the plain fact. So all the guidelines, so with the exception of the ACC, AHA, Heart Rhythm Society guidelines, have now taken aspirin out. The ESC has taken it out. The NICE guidelines in the UK, Asian Pacific Heart Rhythm have taken it out. I think it's being reviewed in the ACC, AHA guidelines right now. They still offer aspirin as a possible alternative for CHADS2 Basket 1. It's much reduced, but it's still there. And I think if it's still there, it may look to people as though maybe it's something you could use. And what's really important and what's happened in the NICE guidelines, this is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in the United Kingdom, they've made a positive recommendation, or if you like, a negative recommendation. Do not use aspirin as a single drug for thromboprophylaxis in atrial fibrillation. I think it is a positive recommendation in that sense. If you'd comment a little bit about the use of aspirin in people already on anticoagulants. That's also another issue because if you add aspirin to an anticoagulant in general, there's going to be more bleeding. And in a number of studies and registries, including one that you've been involved with, Bernie, about a third of the people who are on an oral anticoagulant are taking aspirin in combination with an anticoagulant. And many of those people have absolutely no indication, no vascular disease to be taking aspirin. It's I think just... that this was the paper by Dr. Ben Steinberg uh, using the Duke-based Orbit Registry. It was very striking. I think something like, I don't know, I can't remember, but it was about 30, 40% of people, 35% of people on an oral anticoagulant were on aspirin. And in the vast majority, we could not find any indication for aspirin. And the bleeding rates in that study of the combination about 50% increase. There's no question of that. And even if you've got stable vascular disease, there's also some evidence to suggest that you don't need to have concomitant aspirin. You just need to have an anticoagulant. It's just as effective. Ben, would you agree with the statement that I've made that aspirin is probably the commonest cause of bleeding on warfarin? I think that's probably right. Although now possibly clopidogrel also is sort of looming as a common cause. So we need to reduce bleeding, but we also need to make sure that people in atrial fibrillation are actually anticoagulated instead of being put onto aspirin. I guess the other cause of bleeding on warfarin are non-steroidals. And that again is a large registry study. Well, I think that's right. We need to be really aware of what happens with bleeding because bleeding is one of the usual causes for stopping warfarin or stopping an anticoagulant full stop and NOAC. One of the real issues, of course, is non-persistence. When people stop and don't restart, they're at very high risk of stroke. This is something that we have shown. So, Ben, uh, your final take-home message. I go to the neurology literature to tell us what is the end result of this misperception. And the misperception is that when you look at people who come in with a stroke, like in the big stroke registry in Sweden, 38,000, Atrial fibrillation accounts for one-third of all stroke. And in that group, half of the people were on aspirin. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. In the Adelaide stroke study, of the people who were not on warfarin, which is the majority, all of them with CHADS2 more than two or two or more, 94% were on antiplatelet agent, mostly aspirin. So what we're saying is the end result of this misperception is people coming in with a stroke. So the message is we have clear indications for anticoagulation with the NOx or warfarin, and we are underutilizing these highly effective drugs, and aspirin has almost no role to play. And we're excluding, we're not talking about patients with recent stent placement. That's a completely different topic. Or recent acute coronary syndrome. Yeah, no, Again, we're talking about stroke prevention for atrial fibrillation yeah, per se. And, and in those people, there is still underutilization if you go out in the real world, not necessarily in registries, 
there is still underutilization of anticoagulant. And my final message is a lot of that is due to misperception that aspirin is something that we can do because it's modestly effective and it's safe. Well, it's neither. Thank you, Ben. Thanks very much.